only mode. Good morning, everybody in Europe. Good afternoon uh, to those who are listening to us uh, from China. Welcome to EU SME Centre webinar series. And today's topic is reform of Chinese foreign investment. And uh, what does it mean for small and medium sized enterprises from, uh, from Europe? My name is Ludmila Hiklova and I work in EUSME Center as a legal advisor and I will be today's moderator for the for the presentation. We will have here and we have here Mr. Ronan Diot uh, who will be the speaker for today's uh, webinar, but I will give a proper introduction to him a little bit later. Firstly, uh, and very shortly, very briefly about EUSME Center project. Some of the, some of you are very probably already familiar with the project, far, but for those who are new to our webinars, uh, just a brief introduction. The project is uh, funded by the European Union and its main aim, main goal is to support small and medium sized enterprises from Europe uh, to come to China, either invest or export their products, technologies or services. The project is implemented by six uh, chambers of commerce. You can see them on the on the screen and will run till July 2018. Now about the technical side of the webinar. There is an um, opportunity uh, for you to ask uh, questions anytime uh, during um, during the presentation or at the end after the presentation. So please use this option on your panel. You can see the, the window with the question. So uh, please type uh, your question and uh, send it to us. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, let me say a few words about uh, today's topic. In 2013, Chinese government uh, started quite uh, large changes uh, to the foreign investment. And uh, these changes came in various forms, uh, establishment on uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone, um, amendment to a company law, and uh, later in 2014, uh, they came with a draft of a new investment uh, law. All these, uh, all these subjects uh, will be um, points uh, for, for presentation and uh, discussion during the today's uh, presentation. And uh, our today's speaker, Mr. Ronan Diod, has um, a lot of experience and broad experience in this area. Mr. Diod is a corporate lawyer. He is based in uh, Beijing and his practice uh, focuses on helping small and medium-sized companies, but as well large uh, multinational companies to do business in uh, China. He has extensive experience with contracts and uh, negotiations with the Chinese element. He also focuses on uh, regulatory aspects like anti-bribery laws and a uh, commercial sector uh, regime. He uh, assisted or he established a uh, number of companies um, to establish uh, their foreign invested company in uh, China in highly regulated industries. So in this point, I will give a floor to Mr. Diot. Welcome warmly in our webinar. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ludmila. It's a pleasure to be here with you at the invitation of the EU SME Center. Uh, good morning to those who are in Europe and good afternoon to those uh, who are um, in China. And uh, we have a very um, beautiful blue skies in Beijing after a week of pollution. So it's, uh, it's uh, all good news for me today. Uh, I just um, uh, wanted to uh, talk about the uh, topic of um, foreign investment uh, ref um, controls reform in China, as uh, Ludmila mentioned, because uh, we have seen quite a bit of development in 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 the past year and a half or, or two years. Um, but I think we are at the stage where uh, this is a sort of a turning point where we can analyze whether these these reforms are genuine and will 
uh, change things for foreign investors in China or whether they don't make such a difference. So uh, I guess the, the idea behind this presentation is to analyze whether we are facing a genuine reform or not. Um, first of all, I, 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 um, if I look at the agenda, uh, I think um, as a Frenchman, I, I will have an <laughs> introduction by looking at history. I think this is quite natural to me. Uh, so we'll look at the what has um, happened in, in the past, uh, what, what is the background of the general foreign investment regime in China, and also how this was progressively developed through the use of special economic zones throughout China's recent history since the uh, reform at the beginning of the reform and opening up, up until the uh, quite strategic move of the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, of which I will give a, a, a summary overview. Um, and we'll also look into the new free trade zones that have been approved at the end of last year in Tianjin, Fujian, and Guangdong province. And um, continuing on that, we'll look at uh, developments of the foreign investment catalog in 2015 and also uh, the new negative lift uh, concept, which we will explain in detail later on. And finally, as, as uh, Ludmila mentioned, we'll look into the draft foreign investment law that's been uh, unveiled uh, at the beginning of this year by, by the Ministry of Commerce in, of China, which contains uh, significant proposals to reform the foreign investment um, approval regime. Um, and we'll see how it is closely linked with the current negotiations of the EU-China investment um, agreement. And um, at this point, we would like, as is our tradition, to ask you a question to you as well. And it is for us to better assess your background and your experience. So allow me first to set up a first poll. And the question is, uh, what is your main approach to China? And you have uh, five options, which you can see now on your screens. So please vote whether you are a trading company or you uh, intend to invest, provide cross-border services, all the others. Based on the results of this of this poll, uh, Ronan uh, can better focus on, on aspects uh, which are interesting uh, for you and uh, focus better the presentation. So I can see that the votes are coming. 43% uh, are... It's still growing. Okay, so let me close uh, now. The results show uh, on your screens and you can see that 47% of you are in uh, providing cross-border services, while 27 are um, engaged in trade, selling into China, followed by 17 peers person providing services in China. And um, on the fourth and fifth place are manufacturing and investing for exporting. And uh, with this results, uh, I'm closing the polls and uh, we can go on with the presentation. I think the, the result of the poll is quite interesting because it shows that we're really at a stage of the um, uh, Chinese economy where a lot of foreign companies are interested in selling services and not only goods to, to the Chinese market. Uh, so we have more than 50% of the attendees which are involved in, in the sale of services and the provision of services. And this is clearly an area where, uh, unfortunately, the, the Chinese government has not delivered as much as was expected by foreign investors. But we'll look into this um, uh, later on. Um, just, um, uh, I wanted to give a bit of background on the current foreign investment regime and how it's, it works um, when you are a, a small enterprise or a small and medium enterprise and you want to register a business. The first thing you need to look at is a document called the Foreign Investment Catalog, uh, which classifies the industrial sectors by whether they are accessible to foreign investment. So uh, essentially there are three categories in this catalog, which is the encouraged, restricted, and prohibited categories. Uh, the encouraged sectors uh, are essentially sectors which the Chinese government 
uh, as identified as a priority for the development of the economy. Essentially, it's, it's industries where China acknowledges that it has, uh, which China acknowledges it has a need to develop. Uh, so, for instance, it's, it can be linked to uh, improving uh, certain manufacturing capabilities or improving uh, the well, improving the environment. So there, there would be a category in the uh, Anchorage. Uh, uh, sorry, there would be a, an industry in the Anchorage category of certain types of environmental services or certain type of high-end manufacturing. Uh, and these sectors, Anchorage sectors, used to be entitled to certain benefits, um, in particular tax benefits in the past. Now, these benefits are getting uh, smaller and smaller now, and this is a part of the reason why the foreign investment catalog in the future will be uh, probably scrapped to uh, move uh, to to be replaced by uh, what is being now denominated a negative list, in which there will be only restricted and prohibited sectors. So, uh, restricted sectors have restrictions on control. For instance, uh, it must be there must be the company must be established in in the form of a joint venture, or or the Chinese party must control the company, or or you can't go beyond a certain um, size, for instance, a plant cannot produce uh, more than X tons of of a particular product. Um, and of course, the prohibited sectors are those that are completely inaccess inaccessible to foreign investment. So that's in in China. That's in particular uh, sectors related to publishing or television. Um, for instance, um, certain obligations of technology transfer used to be present in the foreign investment catalog. Uh, they have disappeared. They still remain to some extent in other regulations. Um, now, for those who are not very familiar with the Chinese market and investing in China, you have to know that um, China is a, a, a country which has a pre-investment in foreign pre-foreign investment control system. So, if you want to have an activity in China, you must first uh, go through an approval and registration process, where your project will be examined uh, by the local authorities. It's not just re registering a company; it, it, your project will actually be uh, valued and 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 approved by the authorities before it can happen. So. It's it's a rather long-winded uh, process which has uh, several stages. The first one being the uh, getting approval from the local development and reform commission um, at at the the location where you have where you have chosen to establish your your company or your project. So the development and reform commission is essentially a planning authority. Uh, which is in charge of of ensuring that you know the industry you know, each industry grows in a reasonable way, so that it will not allow a a, a massive uh, polluting project in theory right next to a, a an endangered um, uh, forest, for instance, or, or river. So that's the job of the DRC, making sure that the industry uh, that each industry grows in a harmonious way. So that that's the theory, and then. Uh, the next step is local MOFCOM, which uh, will uh, verify that your project falls into the right category of the investment catalog and that you're not violating the restrictions that might exist in the foreign investment catalog. And finally, you have a, a more simple process, which is with the Administration for Industry and Commerce, the local AIC, which is essentially a sort of, of company's registry uh, um, the local Chinese companies registry, which will review your uh, joint venture contract or your articles of association and, and register them. And, and will also make certain information about your company public on, on, on a national uh, website. And of course, you have to uh, register your company with other ancillary authorities, such as the, the tax, the customs, uh, the SAFE, which is the foreign exchange authority. So there's a bunch of registrations that need to be carried on. Now, of course, uh, the results of having to go through all of these steps, which can be quite time consuming, because at, at each stage you have to present a, a, a file with um, supporting documents, uh, have uh, 
have granted China the not very enviable uh, title of being among the the least um, the least um, easy uh, countries to make business in, uh, especially um, uh, in the start of business category of the OECDs doing business study in, in, in 2013. So there was awareness uh, on the Chinese government part that it was difficult to register a business um, in, in China at that stage. And that uh, is one of the premises and was is one of the reasons why they decided to somehow modernize the uh, approval and registration system and, and the foreign investment regime in in, in the first place. So uh, although this had not kept uh, foreign investors out of China, it could easily uh, keep uh, smaller businesses out of the market because of the complexity, uh, the length and the cost of actually uh, penetrating this market from an administrative perspective. So if you're a large company like IBM or Nokia, these obstacles um, are not really obstacles because you will uh, hire uh, expensive lawyers and, and a number of staff to deal with it. But if you're a small and medium enterprise and you just want to explore the Chinese market, well, the fact that you have to, to uh, complete all these registrations and go all through these uh, approvals could make it really a challenge. And I think that's what the Chinese government understood at a time when it was already foreseeing that growth um, of foreign investment in China was not going to be um, eternal. Now, um, one of the ways um, the Chinese government has addressed this is by uh, creating the Shanghai Free Trade Zone in 2013 uh, to experiment new ways of dealing with uh, foreign investment. If we look back in time, this is not precise. This is not exactly the first time that the Chinese government has used uh, such a way uh, to make experiments and encourage uh, foreign companies to do business in China. Uh, those of you who have been looking at China for a long time will certainly remember the uh, special economic zones of the 1980s that were created um, um, under Deng Xiaoping. And uh, these, the purpose of these zones was precisely the opening of the market and allow foreign investors to dip their foot in the Chinese waters. Uh, so they were all essentially in manufacturing clusters in, 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 in the south. And this started uh, really, as you know, uh, the development of, of the country. Uh, and since then, it's been quite a continuous creation of new entities, a new form of, of special regimes. Um, in 1984, there was a thing that most people probably have forgotten, which was the 14 open coastal cities, which uh, were cities where uh, uh, there were increased uh, facilities to do uh, cross-border um, maritime business and and these coastal cities were encouraged to, to do business with um, with uh, foreign operators um, in 1985 there was uh, an, another launch of three manufacturing cluster uh, deltas corresponding to each of the large rivers of of China uh, 1988 uh, Hainan Island was entirely made a special economic zone, so similar to those that were created in, in 1980. Um, another thing that probably some uh, people have forgotten is uh, six, uh, these six Yangtze River free ports that were created along the, alongside the Yangtze River, again to encourage international trade to go up to the inside of China. Uh, with Chinese ships, but 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 they're carrying China international uh, or foreign-made products. Uh, 1992, uh, creation of border cities that again were some sort of free ports, um, encouraging the international trade with neighboring countries of, of China, including in particular Russia, um, but also um, also uh, in the south, uh, Burma, for instance. Um, in 1990, uh, the 15 uh, free trade zones, which are, were quite different from um, from from the, the Shanghai free trade zone in the sense that they were uh, essentially preoccupied about um, developing uh, tax-free trade uh, and tax-free manufacturing under bonded uh, bonded logistics zones. Um, 
Another massive development, of course, high-tech zones, which we're looking at in, in from 1980 to 1993, looking at the development of high-end manufacturing and and uh, IP uh, high IP uh, value related industries. And finally, in 2013, uh, we have what Ludmila mentioned before, which is the establishment of the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. This uh, which was originally a pilot project, um, and as you can see from the Chinese name, uh, was obviously going to be the first of a series of projects, because if you look at the Chinese name, it says China-Shanghai Free Trade Zone. So there is an assumption that there, were, there was an assumption in 2013 that there would be more free trade zones like the one in Shanghai, and this is exactly what happened at the end of last year, where we had the creation uh, in December, the, the the announcement, and then this year the creation of another um, uh, series of free trade zones in uh, in the Guangdong province. We have three different places where free trade zones have been established in in uh, essentially in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Zhuhai, and in in 2014 as, as well. So the Tianjin free trade zone in the north of China, and in black on your screen, uh, the Fujian free trade zone which are all modern free trade zones in, in the sense that they follow uh, the Shanghai model. I, I will interrupt you, Ronan, at this point. And looking at the being a company back, back in Europe and looking at the map full of uh, dots and, and, and uh, you know, special economic zones and the free trade zones and a cluster, uh, manufacturing cluster deltas. Uh, what would you give uh, as advice to such a company which uh, plans to invest on to do business uh, here in China, export uh, whatever, provide services? How to choose the right uh, place for the in investment? Do these zones uh, make make any sense, or what the company shall focus? I think um, to a large extent, uh, companies should be guided by their commercial interests. So uh, when they have identified a location that is good for their business in, in the sense that it is um, geographically close to their clients or that they know they can find uh, the right employees, funds, the right sales force, uh, I think they should focus on these objectives primarily. Now, if this, if this location that companies have chosen happens to be um, compatible with the choice of a particular uh, area that is under one of the new free trade zones. I think there are advantages in doing that, especially from a practical perspective, because as we will see later on, there's been a clear focus of the Chinese government on on um, easing up the, the way companies are uh, incorporated and registered and accelerating the processes in general. So uh, again, if you have identify the location that commercially makes sense, then you might do yourself a favor by um, um, choosing to register your company in a free trade zone if that's compatible with the location that you have chosen because this way you will have generally access to um, um, civil servants and, and uh, uh, local administrat administrations that are more familiar uh, with uh, foreign investors and foreign investment in general. Um, we will have access to uh, better financial services in a lot of cases. Uh, if, if you are involved in trade, for instance, uh, you will have access to better and faster customs um, services. Uh, in some cases, there will be a tax advantage. So uh, these are not um, things that should be uh, that are not they are not negligible. Uh, they are important, but again, if your location is somewhere in Sichuan Province, you have identified this is the best place for you to start business. Well, then, uh, don't worry about the free trade zones. You should be worried about finding the the exact you know right location from a commercial perspective. Now, looking more closely at the the, the Shanghai free trade zone, this is a, a map that was uh, prepared by by the, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone Administration, by the way, uh, showing the various locations um, that have been chosen in the city. So just as a matter of background for those who are not very familiar with uh, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, it, 
it actually isn't the whole of Shanghai. It's a series of areas inside the city uh, that were generally actually already uh, special areas. So, uh, for instance, there was the Weigao Tiao Free Trade Logistics Park, which was part of these programs that we have seen before, uh, the Weigao Tiao Free Trade Zone, the Pudong Airport Free Trade Zone, and the Yangshan Free Trade Port Zone. So all of these were areas which already had special policies, for instance, for um, tax-free manufacturing, where you could do, um, um, you, you could do manufacturing on, on location uh, without having to pay customs duties and then re-export outside of China without ha to having to pay any kind of taxes as long as you didn't import the product into China. So they were, these were already special areas. And what the Shanghai government did is to unify these three places so that they belong to a newly established entity, which was the, the official China-Shanghai free trade zone. Uh, now... This year, uh, originally, sorry, the, the area, the total area was quite small. It was only 29 uh, square kilometers, which uh, created interesting real estate problems with a lot of, of office uh, space in, in these areas uh, going, um, and the price is going up, uh, people investing in real estate in these areas. Uh, this was, um, this um was in September 2013 when the zone was initially inaugurated, but in 2015 uh, the actual area that is that comprises the free trade zone was extended quite a bit uh, because it now in includes uh, what is essentially the CBD of Shanghai, which is the Liu Jiazui Financial and Trade Zone. So, for those of you who have been to Shanghai, it's is the area where the the Pearl Tower is, and all the tallest buildings in Shanghai are. So all the financial firms and the banks are are now included in the free trade zone area, which was a very significant. It's a very significant move because actually none of the banks or or the financial services firms were going to actually move their offices to um, to the port of Shanghai. So it's an interesting uh, acknowledgement that that it was important to move the the area. A little bit closer to where these people were actually organizing their business. Uh, there's a couple of other area when one is another export processing uh, area, and and another is a high tech park in Zhongjiang. Um, so that's still not the whole uh, surface of of Shanghai, uh, which it shows you that the, the Chinese government and the Shanghai government is still playing with this and still experimenting. Uh, but it has increased the area to about 120 uh, square kilometers, so it's much larger than before. Now, what does the, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone uh, change for companies? Um, well, the main thing is that all companies, uh, regardless of nationality in the zone, are given national treatment. So they are, there is no uh, significant difference when you register a company um, as long as uh, you are not on the negative list, or as long as your industry is not on the negative list. So if you are used to be in an encouraged sector, for instance, or your industry was not listed in the foreign investment catalog at all, there will be no difference in practice in how you register your company as opposed to a, how a local investor would register their company. Um, you just go to the uh, local one-stop sh shop administration of the zone and with the same type of documents, you will be able to register your company. That's, that's how it, it, it works. Um, now, if you are on the negative list, that is, if you are in, active in an industry that is, uh, not, um, is, that is restricted or that is prohibited, well, if you are prohibited, then the story stops here. But if you are in a restricted area, then you um, still uh, you still need to go through uh, Ministry of Commerce approval uh, to get your company registered. So you have a process that is maybe a little bit shorter than in the rest of China, but it's essentially uh, still quite um, time consuming. Uh, so certain sectors have been liberalized in the initial uh, negative list uh, that was issued in 2013. I think it was quite a to be honest, it was quite a, a shy first negative list. There was no 
uh, breakthrough uh, in, 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 in the sense of uh, the number of sectors that were liberalized. Uh, much has been uh, talked about financial services being liberalized in the in the free trade zone area. One of the things that the Chinese government organized uh, to uh, celebrate the inauguration is that he actually invited a number of foreign banks to register a company uh, that would be established on the first day. But so far, we haven't seen we haven't seen much um, f development in the zone uh, in terms of financial services, um, shipping services. Uh, uh, are also um, uh, uh, liberalized, so there's a reduction on on the domestic ownership requirements, which used to exist in the uh, in the foreign investment catalog. Uh, it's also um, known that value-added telecom services will be progressively um, open. That include uh, now that will include now e-commerce. Uh, more anecdotal on the sector of gaming consoles, for instance, uh, most most um, most of you might have heard that uh, Microsoft and Sony can finally sell their products in China after uh, decades-long restrictions. So the PlayStation can finally be sold in, in China through the free trade zone. Uh, legal services have been slightly liberalized as well, such as have been uh, travel agency businesses, artists, agents, to some extent, uh, continuing education and medical institution. Um, <clears throat> so as I uh, mentioned, uh, from a foreign investor's perspective, the uh, cumbersome approval and registration system has been replaced by a one-stop shop administration, and the authorities have managed to keep the application process uh, very short since um, we are looking now from a, a standard process outside the zone of, of 29 working days to get your company registered to about four working days if you, res if you establish your company in the free trade zone. So that's definitely an improvement. And that's why when Ludmila, you asked me the question earlier, you know, does it make sense to be established in the free trade zone? I think it does when you look at these figures. It's it's important, especially for, for small and medium enterprises that have no time to lose. Um, but again, if it, only if it makes sense from a commercial perspective. Uh, also good for uh, small and medium enterprises is the fact that um, annual inspection of the administration for industry and commerce have been replaced by a simple online record filling. So um, if you uh, if you have a company in China outside the free trade zone, you have to you must know that. Uh, every year you have to submit a, a, another file uh, concerning your company, uh, ex explaining what, what what changes have there have been in in the in the situation of the company during the year, uh, and that quite be kind of quite quite cumbersome as well. So this has in, in no longer exists in 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 the free trade zone. For uh, Chinese companies, actually, there's been interesting developments in the zone as well, where you all know that. Um, Chinese in outbound investment has now uh, now excesses foreign investment into China, and the Chinese government has planned something for Chinese companies doing outbound investment transactions as well in the free trade zone because companies basically are, Chinese companies established in the area uh, in the in the free trade zone will be able to enjoy the simplified procedures for for their outbound investment transactions where the simple filing procedure provided that they have um, they have um, the cash to make a transaction, they can complete their transaction and then, and then simply file um, a, a, a declaration um, within five working days um, after they have completed their transaction. Uh, the financial reforms um, um, it's quite a, a different, it's, it's an entire topic of its own, so I won't go into very much detail, but uh, essentially uh, there's much more facility in the free trade zone to do uh, cross-border GMB and foreign exchange payments. Uh, foreign international financial institutions have been uh, have set up shop in, in the free trade zone, so you can go with your usual bank, international bank in the free trade zone and benefit from uh, from the the various types of uh, facilities, so not facilities, but the facilitation 
uh, of of uh, cross border um, cross border payments that uh, have been approved. Um, there's been some, uh, to some extent, some favourable tax policies um, uh, in in the free trade zone. Uh, I just noted a few. Uh, this in individual income tax uh, f is reduced for the payment of stock options. So I think the Chinese government clearly is looking at uh, incentivizing startups to to set up uh, to to be set up in the in the free trade zone, so that they can re re sorry. Uh, remunerate their employees by the way of stock options that will be uh, uh, not tax-free, but but will benefit from from a certain amount of certain amount of tax planning. There's also an exemption of VAT on the import of aircraft and and other favorable tax policies. Now, um, as I mentioned when I was looking at the at the map before, there are three new free trade zones that have been announced, and I'll just go back to the map to show them to you. Um, so in, in green, that is the uh, the Guangdong free trade zone. In blue in the north, it's the Tianjin free trade zone, and, and in black, the Fujian free trade zone. These, um, these, uh, these three new areas have essentially uh, following the same model as the Shanghai free trade zone. Um, they um, do not cover the entire province. There are just a few areas in each in each uh, in each of these three places. In, in Guangdong, is two high tech zones and one development zone. Uh, so one in Guangzhou, one in Shenzhen, and uh, and in Zhuhai. Um, it's um, the Chinese government has made some statements as to what the purpose of each of these uh, new free trade zones is, uh, and that's essentially what I've put here in red. Uh, so the, the Guangdong free trade zone is likely to be used <clears throat> for uh, ordinary manufacturing and shipping services. There are some special lifting of restrictions for Hong Kong and Macau investors. So. Uh, privileging the link to Hong Kong and Macau. Um, again, this this shows you to some extent how um, yes, there will be a free trade zone there, and it will benefit from the same policies as the Shanghai free trade zone. But the Chinese government is quite realistic in its approach. So the purpose of of developing a free trade zone there is actually to improve or increase something that does, that already exists. Where everybody would know that. Uh, the link between Hong Kong and, and Guangzhou and Shenzhen is one of the most important economic, international, or at least interprovincial uh, um, links in, 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 in China. And, 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 and therefore, yes, there is a free trade zone, but it doesn't create uh, something for nothing. It's, it's an improvement to something that already exists. That is also true for the Fujian free trade zone, which is going to be established mainly for the purpose of being a connection point for with Taiwan and attract Taiwanese investment. But that's, again, something that is um, geographically makes sense and also already exists. There's a lot of Fujianese investment in Taiwan, and there's quite a bit of Taiwanese investment in Fujian province um, as well. And finally, uh, the change in free trade zone comprises a series of, of traditional um, uh, manufacturing clusters and, and development areas in Tianjin, the Tianjin port, but the Tianjin airport and the Binhai new area where a lot of foreign invested enterprises are already uh, present. So it's also in, important to look at it in the framework of, of the metropolis that Beijing is building between Beijing, Tianjin and Hebei province. Uh, and so this large area that Beijing is is that China is building to be the um, macro, macro metropolis of the north uh, deserved its its own free trade zone in in the eyes of the other central government. Now these new free trade zones will essentially follow the general approach of the Shanghai free trade zone. So there will be uh, the negative list uh, approach. There will be simplified business registration processes, simplified customs and ta tax formalities, and, and better financial tools. Um, however, the um, 
as I mentioned, the the general uh, various commercial and business specificities are already largely in existence, and the general focus is derived from reality. Um, and I guess that's what I mean is that if you know that you know where you should have access the market from, as I mentioned before, if you know you uh, you should be in Fujian province because you're a Taiwanese investor, then the new free trade zone are not going to change your your perception. As opposed to that, if you haven't yet entered the market and you're considering any location, it does make you know it is it is a sound option to choose one of these free trade zones um, to benefit from. Uh, from the advantages of simplified business registration or or simplified customs and tax formalities, for instance. Yeah, I have a question uh, here in the, this point. Maybe some of the uh, companies or the listeners in the audience might be interested how in practice, how it works. If I establish uh, my company in a Shanghai free trade zone or any of the other free trade zones, how then it works? Am I allowed to do business only within the zone or can I reach the customers or businesses outside the zone? You mentioned, for example, the gaming consoles. So, yeah, how, how that would work? Okay. So, uh, fortunately, the Chinese government's approach in this uh, to this is, yes, you can register a company in the free trade zones and sell consoles elsewhere. So, um the theory for all industries is that you can access the rest of the market by registering a company in in the free trade zone. Now, that is all. That is not always uh, the possible approach for all companies. For companies that are selling a particular good, that makes sense. But if you're providing services and have to provide services in a particular location, just think about healthcare, for instance. If you want to establish a hospital. Uh, you'll, you can establish a hospital in the free trade zone, but then uh, if you have to establish another hospital elsewhere, then the policies, the favorable policies will no longer apply. So there's a bit of a try and, uh, and try and fail or try or, <laughs> try or succeed approach. It's, uh, it's, it's not the same for all companies. Generally speaking, the, the, the idea of the Chinese government is that you can set up a company uh, in the free trade zone and do business all over China. For certain industries, it's not so simple. Um, all right. Uh, so, but the, one of the most important things, I think, is that uh, in the future, we knew and we anticipate that uh, the rest of the country will benefit fairly soon of, of, of these things that have been experimented in free trade zones. So if you're not too keen on establishing a company from a location perspective, from a business perspective, in a free trade zone, because it doesn't make sense for you. Um, I think it's not an, a complete um, impediment. I mean, you you can you can choose another location, knowing that uh, it's fairly likely that most of these benefits will, will be rolled out in in the next few years, and that's especially um, true because there will be a draft for there is there is there will be a new foreign investment law. Uh, in the future. Now, another development that has happened uh, this year, and is a little more anecdotal, but we have to talk about it, is it, there um, has been a, a new negative list in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone in 2014. Uh, while formally it has limited the number of restricted sectors from 190 to 139, uh, and with some limited improvements in in a number of sectors, I think a lot of inv foreign investors were still quite disappointed by the amount of the reductions, uh, and and some of them have uh, even described this uh, uh, reduction in numbers. It's just a play a play with numbers. Um, it's it's fair and not entirely fair. I think there are there have been some improvement in. Maritime transport and healthcare as well. For instance, it's easier to set up uh, small-scale hospitals in, in Shanghai. You don't have uh, the need to spend um, as much money, or you don't have a minimum registered capital for for hospitals in in the free trade zones uh, in the free trade zone as you can have in the rest of the country. There's been some improvement in in financial services and microcredit, and also telecommunication communication services. But it's true, there's no there's been no breakthrough in the major sectors that foreigners were looking at, such as banking or, or insurance. 
Uh, now, what was really surprising is the fact that there's been a new foreign investment catalog in 2015. Well, actually, this was released in in uh, in 2014 in draft for comments, but it was still surprising because I think most people were expecting that there wouldn't be any new iteration of the foreign, foreign investment catalog following the opening of the Shanghai Free Trade Zone and the negotiation of of investment agreements between China and Europe. Uh, but anyway, there's been a new a new iteration of the catalog. Again, very limited developments. Uh, some uh, liberalization of e-commerce to some extent. Uh, certain pharmaceutical and medical products uh, and some agricultural sectors. Um, overall, again, no breakthrough in, in, in the sectors that foreign investors are mostly, in, uh, or large foreign investors are mostly interested in, such as banking, insurance, or the manufacturing of complete automobiles, for instance, and actually a lot of sectors that have been liberalized or that are no longer restricted are of very limited interest to, to foreign companies. So I've put here that traditional Chinese medicine products, which used to be prohibited for foreign investors, are now uh, no longer prohibited. So if you are a hopeful manufacturer of, of traditional Chinese medicine and a foreigner, which is a rather unlikely combination, uh, you, ca you can now. Um, now, just um, looking at what um, the, the most pressing um, thing that happened this year is the new draft foreign investment law. This was uh, uh, an, uh, announced at the beginning of the year uh, uh, in a rather, um, um, I would say, um, interesting way. So there was a... a, a a meeting that was organized by MOFCOM, and, uh, which invited all the foreign chambers of commerce in, in its office in February without really um, announcing uh, what the topic was. But uh, it, at, at such meeting, they announced that there would be a draft foreign investment law that would be published um, uh, that very day um, for in draft for commons. Uh, this was in January, to, uh, to January uh, this year. The public consultation period ended in February, and we know that this foreign investment law is expected to be passed during uh, this National People's Congress, that is, before 2018. Now, the obvious uh, key to this, uh, a reading key to this, is that the, the passing of this free, sorry, this um, foreign investment law uh, is strongly related to the negotiation of the US and EU investment agreements. And, and that was made very clear by MOFCOM during that, that meeting. The new foreign investment law will unify uh, all the existing uh, PRC foreign investment laws, so the, the law on joint ventures, on equity joint ventures, and the law on cooperative joint ventures, but also the law on uh, wholly foreign invested enterprises, and it, it will also replace some other laws and regulations. So which used, what used to be a, a rather complex patchwork of regulations will now become some form of in foreign investment uh, code. And essentially, the main consequence is that um, the uh, approach that has been followed in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone uh, which is uh, generally a very good approach, will be uh, rolled out to the entire country. So uh, uh, there will be a liberalization of market entry, which is what we uh, also call national treatment. Chinese government approval will no longer be required if you are not active in an industry that is not restricted or prohibited. Uh, there will be a simplification of the process for foreign investors to set up their business presence in China, so probably uh, the one-stop shop approach will be uh, mirrored in, in every uh, province. Um, there will be a negative list, uh, which will replace the foreign investment catalog, which will only have restricted and prohibited categories. Uh, and if you are on the negative list in the restrictive category, there will sti still be uh, an approval process. But the approval process will be in, in mainly industrial, and will, in, in theory, in the MOFCOM will not look at your documents, will, but will only be looking at, at the nature of the investment and the shareholding. So if 
uh, what used to take a lot of time was that actually Mofcom and, uh, and the Administration for Industry and Commerce, you, you looked into your documents in a very detailed way. And now under the draft foreign investment law, they're not supposed to, uh, to be doing that anymore. Uh, now, it's, on the, it's not all good news under the draft foreign investment law. Uh, in particular, the scope of what is considered foreign investment is much bigger. So it includes, of course, greenfield investments, so the creation of a company, mergers and acquisitions, but also it includes loans, uh, uh, um, some concession agreements, so acquisition of mining rights, and a variety of contractual arrangements. So when in the, in the past, foreign investment was only considered foreign investment when you acquired a company or you created one, there's a, a variety of essentially contractual arrangements will be considered uh, foreign investment. So what could be could go under the radar before is no longer to be able to uh, to, to 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 go under the radar and will have to be uh, controlled by the local authorities. Also, there's a possibility of conditional approval so that essentially your improvement could, your investment could be approved on the condition on, under certain conditions so for instance hiring a certain number of people or divesting from another uh, in industry or, or entity the definition of foreign investors will be modified uh, and that's a quite actually quite a um, a change in approach. So while before the theory of appearance prevailed, and if you were foreign investors registered in, in Hong Kong, for instance, so if you had a company registered in Hong Kong investing in China, you were considered a foreign investor uh, just because that company was registered in a foreign, um, in a foreign jurisdiction. But if the new approach will be that if you're a Chinese individual that holds an investment through a series of offshore vehicles, then you will be considered still a domestic investor. So uh, the theory of appearance has been replaced by a theory of, of actual control. Um, so that's, that's for um, the, uh, the, 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 let's say, the less positive aspects of, of the law. There are actually some very negative aspects of, of the foreign investment law. One of them is the replacement of the VIE structures um, and it's essentially the phasing out of VIE structures. Now, for those who are not familiar with the term VIE structures, it's essentially a sort of um, contractual arrangement that is used by companies which are active in certain restricted sectors to uh, be able to invest in China without actually making a, an equity investment. So if, especially in the, in the internet sector, uh, there's been, there, there are quite a lot of restrictions in China which prevent China, foreign companies from actually, uh, um, from actually investing in, 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 in the market. So they use a series, uh, they use a domestic vehicle uh, controlled by local shareholders, um, but also um, managed by them through contracts to invest in that sector. And it's been very clear uh, from Mofcom that these arrangements will no longer be possible and that unless they are controlled by Chinese shareholders. Obviously, if in a lot of internet companies, that is not the case, and the real shareholder and the real controller is a foreign company. So it is very likely that these will have to be phased out when the law is passed. Uh, another negative point is the fact that there will be very uh, significant regular reporting obligations to Chinese authorities. So again, the uh, annual examination uh, will no longer exist, but the extent of the reporting will be increased tenfold, and it's always uh, in, in try, intriguing to know, you know, where the information that will be provided is is going, and, and especially whether it can go to your competitors uh, or to other third parties which um, um, could use this information against you. Um, the uh, the final negative point is that there's still a very strong focus in the draft foreign investment law on the national security review, which has a very wide scope and still uh, very little transparency uh, safeguards are included. Now, what's um, the last item of the agenda today is the, uh, the future EU-China investment agreement. 
Some of you might know that both the US and the EU have been negotiating investment agreements with China for several years, and they both are now at the drafting stage when they're actually exchanging papers after agreeing on the main principles of, of, um, of these agreements. Um, the EU already has 26 bilateral investment treaties in place with China, which mainly deal with investment protection. So the focus of the European Union, as a European Union with this investment agreement has always been very clear. They don't want to replace these 26 agreements by one. They want to get more, and in particular, what they want to get is more than investment protection. They want national treatment for European companies. They want, of course, uh, a negative list approach, which uh, China is apparently ready to give them. And they want, uh, first and foremost, more market access. So making sure that this negative list is short enough to satisfy European companies. And there will also be provisions in this agreement that prohibit indirect restrictions or indirect discrimination uh, such as licensing requirements that are, are especially onerous for, for foreign companies and, and so on. Um, it is also foreseen that there will be an investor state dispute resolution pro, uh, mechanism, which is always quite difficult to put in place and it, it's not necessarily easy to um, get approval for this mechanism inside the European Union. Uh, it's not, not hard to imagine that people would be quite cautious with having a Chinese company, for instance, sue uh, one uh, EU member state uh, because it estimates and deems that uh, the member state has not uh, complied with its obligations under the investment agreement. So uh, all in all, uh, we wish that these negotiations are successful and uh, hopefully investors can expect that they will get better market access and better transparency and also uh, a unified protection against expropriation uh, by by the relevant uh, states, be it China or any member states of the European Union. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ronan. Uh, we have received a few questions. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, our participants if they have further questions, please send us um, and uh, we will answer. We still have a few minutes till, till the end. Uh, Ronan is now reading some of the, the, the questions and meantime I would like to um, remind you of our next webinar which is going to um, take place in July 6 and it will be on digital marketing and uh, two weeks later um, July 21st we will have a webinar on, uh, on uh, funding. So now I give the micro back to Ronan. Um, there's a question on e-commerce, essentially what kind of e-commerce business models are being approved by authorities and which ones are still restricted. Uh, I think the answer to this is quite simple. So uh, e-commerce has been fully uh, liberalized. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's of course uh, a, a difficult uh, uh, market. There's a lot of competition, but if uh, the, the key problem is not uh, only e-commerce actually. The key problem is is obtaining one of those famous ICP licenses, which allow foreign investors to um, run commercial websites in China. And to, to some extent, uh, th this is a, a topic in development. There's been some um, announcements last week, I think, by the Ministry of Information Technology about, about the fact that e-commerce uh, will be fully uh, liberalized in practice, as opposed to just in theory. And I think we'll, we'll see that um, the, the, the sector will be fully liberalized sometime this year or, or the next year in practice. Uh, uh, now, um, the, the, the nuts and bolts uh, will take time to, to, to get through. Um, but but I'm, I'm very uh, hopeful that this will be uh, they will be fully liberalized. I mean, when I mentioned the the VIE structure, the end of the VIE structure, when I was looking at the um, at the draft foreign investment law, I think the Chinese government, when when they are saying that the VIE structure will disappear, are not looking at demolishing. Uh, the business of Amazon or the other foreign investors in this sector. They know very well that uh, 
e-commerce is is very important for internal consumption. It's I mean there's very few places in the world where e-commerce is as widely used as China. Therefore, it it would be shooting itself in the foot in terms of you know boosting domestic demand if they if they targeted foreign investors which are active in this sector. So I'm fairly hopeful that it will be fully liberalized at least before uh, the uh, the draft foreign investment law is passed. And then, what, yeah. Yeah, then uh, we have a question. So it's probably a question from one of the companies which are already established in China. What will happen to existing companies under the new foreign investment law? Um, that's a, an interesting question, especially for joint venture companies, because uh, joint venture companies um, under the current regulation have a different government governance uh, system than under the the Chinese company law. So, um, if you have established, a, 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 let's say, a 50/50 uh, or 49/51 joint venture company in China, it might well be that you control it through the board because you appoint, as the foreign investor, you appoint more directors uh, to the board than um, than the Chinese side, but still. It, it's still a 50-50 um, company, uh, sorry, a joint venture. Under the Chinese company law, only the shareholding matters. So the number of directors doesn't matter. And what the draft foreign investment law says is that uh, in all companies, after the foreign investment law is passed, shall follow the PRC company law in every respect. So your governance uh, regime might change after the draft foreign investment law is passed. There are some grandfathering. Um, there is some sort of grandfathering mechanism uh, in the draft foreign investment law, which gives a three-year period for companies to adapt. But the reality is that it's not going to be very simple because if I was the if I was the affected party, uh, be the foreign party or the Chinese party, and in other words, if I have the if I'm in a 50-50 joint venture, and I have less directors than the other side, uh, I would not agree to do any changes. I would just sit down until uh, the, uh, the the law elapses or the, the, the grandfathering period elapses and mir miraculously I will have control of the company or I will have at least equal rights in a company when I was previously, um, I didn't have control. So it's not very clear how this problem will be solved. Okay, thank you very much, Rana, for answering the question. Thank you very much as well for interesting presentation. And I hope that we will have opportunity to have you and invite you uh, here uh, here again. Well, thank you very much, Ludmila, for the invitation. Yeah. And uh, in the following one uh, few seconds, uh, in fact, uh, I would like to inform you about what's going to happen with the within the center. What about new activities? We are about to publish uh, several new publications or updates. Uh, food and beverage update is on the way. We will soon publish profit repatriation and uh, meat import report and uh, as well company uh, reporting duties. I would like to as well remind you that uh, USME Centre is now providing uh, technical services, which includes finding uh, distributors or the importers. Uh, we are able to check on your legal documentation and the contracts. Uh, we provide service in the market uh, access uh, advice and uh, partner verification. So please, if you have any of, uh, if you are interested in any of those services, uh, you are you are welcome, and uh, we will look forward to to meet you again in our next webinar, which is as I said, July the sixth on digital marketing. Thank you for participation and have a nice day. <laughs>